Hi, good evening. Welcome to session six of day one of IFPP 2021. We will be looking at the role of telemedicine and cardiovascular pharmacotherapy in this session. My name is Agnes and I'm a, and I'm a pharmacist at Changi General Hospital in Singapore. We have with us this evening a group of panelists and speakers who are recognized in the field. Our four speakers are Professor Benjamin Sirica, Professor Ramiro Vakanavaha, Dr. Karen Cole, and Dr. Mungunchi McDava. Sharing the session with me is Professor Edgardo Escobar. Professor Escobar is a professor of medicine at the University of Chile. He is also the medical director of Atris Health International Telemedicine System of Chile, and he sits on the board of directors for ISPP. Please join me in welcoming Professor Escobar. We will open our session today. Good evening, good morning to everybody. Um, I have the privilege to co-chair the session uh, dedicated to, the, to, to telemedicine with Agnes Lim. Uh, telemedicine has been considered to be a scientific discipline between medicine and technology. It can be said that technology development has advanced almost completely and the way have to the way have to use these tools in a clinical setting is well regulated considering clinical and ethical aspects. Therefore there is an increasingly demand for integrating telemedicine to the usual clinical practice. There is a strong evidence of the contribution of telemedicine in the control of chronic diseases and in the detection of cardiac emergencies as atrial fibrillation and myocardial infarction. Our own experience has been very rewarding helping primary care physicians to take quick decisions with the report of electrocardiograms within a few minutes or 24 hours ambulatory blood pressure or arrhythmia recordings and different imaging techniques as well in a very brief period of time. COVID-19 pandemic has triggered and made necessary an increasing demand for telemedicine practice and it made very evident the importance of this form of medical practice. We have been very fortunate bringing together for this occasion speakers of great experience in the field in the field to whom we would like to thank for their participation on behalf of the International Society of Cardiovascular Therapy. Agnes Lim will introduce them and at the end we will the possibility to answer questions from the audience and to our further comments. Thank you very much. Agnes. Thank you, Professor Escobar. These are some disclosures before we start the talks. The content of this webinar is copyrighted by the IFPP and should not be distributed without the prior permission of the IFPP. The views and opinions expressed in the webinar are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the IFPP. The session will be live streamed via Wonder and IFPP and APFP Facebook and YouTube pages. The European Board for Accreditation in Cardiology grants CME points for attendees who attend the full session. You will receive your certificate of attendance upon completing a survey sent via email after the webinar. For any questions, please give, key them into the live Q&A box. We will try to answer all your questions during the panel discussion if time permits. Otherwise, we will answer via email. Please send your questions to the following email, secretariat at ifpp2021.com. Our first speaker is Professor Benjamin Sirica. Professor Sirica is a cardiologist at Brigham's Women's Hospital in Boston and Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. His talk today is on reimagining chronic cardiovascular disease management, optimizing care at scale. Hi, my name is Benjamin Sirica. I'm a cardiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and it's a pleasure to talk to you about telehealth, in particular about reimagining chronic cardiovascular disease management, uh, how to optimize our care at scale. Here are my disclosures. 
So in cardiology, we are blessed with a lot of data on how to best manage chronic disease management, but we still have problems. For example, in the field of cholesterol management, um, we've had some great studies that have started almost 20 years ago with the Prove It Timmy 22 study as an example that led to a high tier publication in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that intensive versus moderate lipid lowering with statins after an acute coronary syndrome improve outcomes. This led to multiple publications. It's been cited multiple times. This, as well as some other data on intensive lipid lowering, has led to a widespread guideline adoption of the recommendation for high-intensity statin after acute coronary syndrome by multiple professional societies. But we see now, 10 to 15 years after that, that we still have great uh, 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 gaps in care, where in the United States we see that high-intensity statin is only treated, used in two-thirds of patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And this is despite the, uh, the um, fact that this is relatively low-cost drugs. It can be up to $7 per patient payment per month. So many of these drugs are generic. And we see a similar pattern in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in the treatment of hypertension, where up to a half of patients may not be treated. Now, the problem is that when we rely on the traditional patient-doctor relationship to deliver population health, there are many barriers to care. And just having this one-on-one -on -one interaction cannot scale to meet the public health challenges that exist in chronic cardiovascular disease. And there are many reasons why we have been unsuccessful in implementing health at scale. Um, and that there are not enough providers, it's inequitable access to specialized care or poor access to specialized care. Doctors and offices are high cost resources. There's great heterogeneity in care. There's slow and varied uptake. There are many entrenched workflows which are hard to change. We often have contradictory incentives for financial rewards um, to, or reimbursements for care. And there's actually insufficient time for patient teaching and support to have patients empowered to, to take their care. And, and the truth is doctors are often not the best at uh, how to uh, train and motivate patients to take medicines. So we feel that there is a, a clear problem statement here, that there are multiple systemic factors that preclude current clinical infrastructure from resolving these gaps in care and uh, preventing the delivery of optimal care. And we feel that we've designed a process and a system that can efficiently, effectively, and safely address barriers to care, bypassing the limitations of standard care models, and improve access to care. So how do we do this? To design a, redesign a chronic care management program, we feel that it has to be high touch. Uh, and we use patient navigators who are non-licensed professionals um, uh, to enhance the education, coaching, and longitudinal sport. We use expert-defined guidelines, um, uh, expert-defined guideline-directed workflows and treatment algorithms to standardize care. Uh, we integrate prescribing and medical titration into our care using pharmacists, um, and the pharmacists don't need to get co-signatures uh, in this model, such they're, that they're able to deliver care in a model that's been used a lot for our anticoagulation clinics. We actively uh, look in our electronic medical, medical records to identify those patients who are um, uh, uh, out, of, out of standard of care, and we proactively try to uh, uh, contact them and, and include them. And then each patient, when they're in our program, has a personalized journey based on their comorbidities and preferences. And then we use digital tools to facilitate automation when that's useful and real-time data collection to define next best steps. And what does that mean and how do we do that? It really is a combination of several things. We have to have, um, uh, we have a, a, an engine that we call where we have a cross-functional team made up of clinicians, which include pharmacists, nurses, doctors. We have our um, non-licensed providers, our navigators. And then we have an IT team, technology team of uh, software developers and data experts. Um, and that team uses an agile methodology uh, which is from the software uh, uh, world to try to develop uh, new workflows and can continually uh, improve those workflows and using uh, expanding reusable platform um, to be able to uh, use different 
uh, automated features that can be used in different settings. And these can be different communication tools, they can be notification tools, they can be workflow automation. And through all of this, we have designed uh, digitally transformed clinical services that include workflow management, algorithmically informed care and prescribing, communication channels, data and analytics, and uh, these produce these new clinical services that can be um, uh, uh, delivered in multiple different scenarios. And so the idea is that we take the traditional care model on the left, which is really dependent on the provider, mostly the MD, and the patient, and move it to the right, where we are able to manage many more patients in a remote care delivery platform that is staffed by navigators, uh, doctors, pharmacists, nurses, but by doing um, uh, omni-channel communication, education, uh, lab and medication prescriptions, uh, integrating data and remote physiologic monitoring and, uh, and leveraging workflow automation, we can provide care for many more patients. In our experience, we've worked in the heart failure um, diabetes, lipids, and hypertension space. This is data from the first 5,000 patients who went through our hypertension and lipid therapy, where we saw that those patients who reached maintenance had much greater utilization of uh, any lipid-lowering therapy from 78 to 97 percent. Predominantly with statins, but we increased the use of azetamide and PCSK9 inhibitors when, in, uh, when necessary. And if you looked at all the patients enrolled, not only those who achieved maintenance, we still were able to see significant improvements in guideline-directed care. Uh, this uh, corresponded uh, to a couple high-risk populations. In those patients with atherosclerotic disease, we had almost everybody on some type of lipid-lowering therapy uh, by the end of the program. Um, uh, most of it was statins, but again, there, in this uh, higher-risk group, we had more use of azetamibe and PCSK9 inhibitors. In those patients who had an LDL greater than 190, suggesting they had severe hypercholesterolemia, probably some genetic component, we also significantly increased the use, utilization of lipid therapy, statins, azetamibe, and PCSK9 inhibitor. And with this increase in drug utilization, we saw oh, in those patients who achieved maintenance a 52 milligram per deciliter reduction in LDL, uh, and in everybody who was enrolled, um, including those patients who didn't uh, complete the study, we saw a 24 milligram per deciliter reduction in LDL cholesterol. And if you look at the different groups, ASCVD, diabetes, severe hypercholesterolemia, and primary prevention, we see similar uh, 40 to 60 millimeter per deciliter reductions in LDL cholesterol. And this diagram just shows you how patients changed from the beginning on the left to the right in terms of their lipid lowering therapy. And you can see that on the left, there's a, a large group in pink that did not have uh, um, high utilization of um, medications. Um, and on the right, you can see that many of these patients were started on high intensity statin or moderate intensity statin. And those on moderate intensity statin, many got up titrated Azetamibe was added to many patients, um, and this is the way in which we were able to optimize medications using an algorithm. We had a similar um, blood pressure uh, program, and, uh, and we can see that those patients who qualified for blood pressure on the left had blood pressures that were quite high at 165 over 92. We sent everybody in the program a um, uh, a blood pressure cuff that was uh, automatically sending data back to us and at home their baseline blood pressures were lower which is known at 138 over 78 which is still elevated but in those patients who uh, completed our program we saw a 14 millimeter reduction systolic and a 6 millimeter reduction diastolic in terms of blood pressure. Um, on the right of this slide you can see how, the util how patients were utilized in terms of their medications. A, B, C, D hypertension medications are the angiotensin uh, receptor blockers, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitors, B are beta blockers, C are calcium blockers, and D are diuretics. And you can see that uh, compared to baseline, we had much higher utilization of any medications, but we also increased doses as well as added doses so that many patients ended up on uh, multiple medications to achieve their control. Now, I think
when we think of telehealth in context, there are many reasons um, why it is important for us to, to continue on this path. And this is from the American Heart Association, where you can see that the overall goal is to enhance population wellness. And this is in particular true for chronic cardiovascular disease, where we see that this starts early in age and requires decades of treatment to try to prevent heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, and peripheral arterial disease. But to do that, we have to expand access of care for all. Um, we have to address uh, health equity, social determinants of health. We have to str uh, strengthen the public health infrastructure enhance and educate public health workforce, and empower patients. And telehealth, I think, is one of the key areas how we can do this, because we can't do this with just um, the uh, uh, standard, um, standard clinical pathways. And you can see in this diagram, there are the icons with the person on the telephone there, where telehealth is in particularly important in enhancing population wellness. There are a lot of challenges on how we're going to do this, and some of these are, are highlighted uh, here. Some of these may be more focused on the United States, but I think um, they are applicable across the world. Um, there are still many ways in which telehealth doesn't fit into the traditional uh, model in which um, medical care and medical licensing uh, and medical payments um, are formed, and this is going to be a work in process. And to do this, we're going to have to engage with those bodies that license um, uh, healthcare providers, um, how we credential patients, uh, pre credential providers, whether it's doctors, nurses, or non licensed personnel, to be able to help in telehealth. We have uh, differences in the scope of practice. When can people prescribe and under what conditions can they prescribe? Um, patients have to understand what they're uh, being involved in and have informed consent, not like a clinical trial of informed consent, but informed consent that they're participating in a telehealth program. There's liability, which again is mostly uh, relevant to the United States. Uh, there's the, the risk of fraud and abuse. Uh, many of these programs can be supported by government uh, um, as well as private insurance companies and we have to ensure that people are um, applying them appropriately and then really identify how we can deliver the best care. So all of these are challenges to health, telehealth but ones I think that we can uh, as a community um, overcome because it really is critical that we do uh, address these otherwise we will not be able to deliver um, adequate chronic cardiovascular care uh, to the entire population across the world that are suffering from these conditions. And so to summarize, I would say that there are still large gaps in chronic cardiovascular care management. And this is despite the fact that there are literally uh, hundreds of studies that have shown benefit of uh, many therapies in chronic disease. And we still have yet to achieve, in many cases, even 50% adherence to these guidelines. Um, addressing these gaps in care will require dramatic care redesign. Simply adding more providers and clinics will not be enough. And transformative change is needed, and telehealth is key to that. And uh, uh, we need remote delivery, task-shifting, algorithmically-driven care, standardized, digitally-enabled workflows to be able to do this. And with these standardized workflows, we'll be able to improve our data input, which I think will drive uh, improvement even more rapidly and with greater evidence. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Sirika. Do continue to key in your questions in the live Q&A box throughout the session. Our next speaker is Professor Ramiro Vakanavaha. Professor Vakanavaha is a physician specialist in critical care medicine and a professor at the National University of Kumawe. For the last two years, he has served as director of the telehealth department at Clinica Pastor Nanquen, from where he has done numerous works and publications in telehealth. In this presentation, he will talk about the detection of pulmonary thromboembolic disease by home telemonitoring protocols in COVID patients. Hello, thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about detection of pulmonary thromboembolic disease by home telemonitoring protocols in COVID patients. 
I am indeed a doctor specialist in critical care medicine, but for the last couple of years, I am the director of telehealth department at Clinica Pasteur Neuquén, Argentina, and I'm also a faculty at University National University of Comahue. I have no financial disclosure or conflict of interest with the presented material in this presentation. So this is uh, my location work. I am in the southwest of Argentina. This is called the state of Neuquén. Uh, it's a big city. I work in Clinica Pasteur. It has four buildings, including chronic mechanical ventilation patients discharge. Our local epidemiology of COVID-19 at the day of July 21, we have a total cases, positive cases of 107,287 patients. We have new cases per day at 247 cases per day today. Debt, we have 2,074 deaths and the ICU occupation is around 80%. A couple of months ago, it was uh, nearly to 98%. We start with this project uh, in March of 2020. We published this project in the magazine, ITT magazine. It's called Telemedicine in Context of Coronavirus Pandemic Domiciliary Telehealth Monitoring Project. It was a big, big um, project to start at that time. The project goals are opportunity and accessibility to the health system. It's about decentralizing the care of patients with mild symptoms and sit in patients' room with low risk, low complexity cases, reduce visits to guards to following up controls. It's about security, reduce the risk of, of the hospitalization in mild cases, reduce exposure of healthcare staff reduce the movement of patients through public roads to care centers. I mean, positive patients, of course. Efficient, optimize re human resources, reduce consumption of critical inputs, optimize hospital capacity. Um, it's about effective daily monitoring patients ability to detect complications and more complex requirements. Equitable, provide all the use of the same savers. And I have to say that it's um, it's free for all the of the population of the state. Patient centered allows medical monitoring, maintaining isolation at home. The target patients was um, confirmed COVID nineteen cases. Every probable case that eventually present PCR for uh, COVID nineteen uh, positive. The patients must be in some conditions to be able to en enroll in the program, must be stable, available care at home, protective equipment available, isolation care, and there must be no household members who may be at higher risk of complications from the infection, such as, for example, people over 65 years old, young children, pregnant women, immunocompromised people, with chronic disease of the heart, lungs, diabetes, or kidney failure. We provide to the patients a home monitoring kit with a thermometer, portable saturometer, tensiometer, guides and recommendations for caring for the environment, alarm guides guide, registration and installation of the telemedicine platform use it, instructions for use, contact and respiratory isolation supplies and alcohol in health. So the implementation of the protocol, including the um, patient record, the first contact at the first 24 hours, vital parameters record, consultations, view, review of the guides, and tracing with a daily video consult from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. the seven days of the week. The patient start the video consults anytime in that range um, to the day. And and during the video consulting, they can upload images, PDF, words, and take pictures of the patient, of the doctor, and in, in both ways. All of these remains saved in a record and 
can be can be shared, can be saved, can be do whatever the institution wants to do with it. Sorry. So about the detecting of pulmonary thromboembolic disease specifically, we develop a walking test with a, in a stable patients refer at least one episode of dyspnea, video consult software on, and walk in the house for at least three minutes with the SAT on. This is of course for uh, stable patients and um, it's supervisive in any time. So we use this criteria to, to positive findings and high suspicion of thromboembolic disease. If the SATs drops five points from a starting SATs or the SATs drops below 92% nor starting SATs considering evidence of severe dyspnea, heart rate acceleration more than 50% from base, heart rate acceleration more than 85% from expected maximum heart rate for the age. This is uh, taken from cardiovascular ergometric test of um, progressive uh, with effort. So we, in, in these cases, we translate to the patient to respiratory assist center of Clinica and do some lab test and x-ray and uh, angiotac tomography, a lung angiotomography. And uh, the positive finding is correlation angiotac with high suspicion telemonitoring value. Positive evidence of thromboembolic disease in angiotac is 96%. 98% subsegmentary thromboembolic disease and the 86% more than one segment. We started immediately the treatment with uh, intronation, a low nasal flow oxygen sometimes, starting anticoagulation with inoxaparin um, for at least five days, continuing with anticoagulation treatment ambulatory with rivaroxaban 20 milligrams a day for six months. Telemedicine tracing program following the next 10 days to discharge and uh, hematology following two. Um, from March 2020 to July 2021, we have uh, around 902 patients enrolled today. 50% of patients uh, with indication of um, evaluation in the clinic, 80% hospitalized, 82% <clears throat> pulmonary disease identification positive. This project has have uh, some weakness. The study is not closed yet. Data process still remains pendant. No controlled patient cases and technical issues with the devices mark type and, and other things should be considered. Anyway, there is, um, it's clear that is the benefits of using telemedicine. Decrease the chance of spread daily clinical monitoring with two-way contact possibilities, evolutionary follow-up and response to treatment, lower cost, decrease the use of hospital resources, allows evolutionary traceability, treatment response record, immediate response plan for complication and eventualities. Uh, and about detection of thromboembolic disease, the high suspicion criteria with high sensibility and, and specificity Correlation with clinic findings, correlation with angiotac findings, and we don't know yet if reduced mortality, probably the answer to this question will be yes. Here is some reference about the presentation, the magazine where the project was published, and some for uh, HL7 protocols and um, legal issues uh, in, in Argentina about telemedicine. And um, here is some personal reference too. This is my email in my LinkedIn profile for any contact. It will be a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vakanavaha, for the interesting talk that is very applicable in our current climate of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our third speaker is Dr. Karen Cole. Dr. Karen Cole is the Assistant Chief Nursing Officer at the Ministry of Health of Singapore. She is also an advanced practice nurse at the National University Hospital. And today she will share with us her telemedicine experience in the Immaculate Trial. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karen, and I'd like to thank the organizer for this opportunity to share my experience on the Immaculate Study. 
Um, for the purpose of the presentation, I will, be I will be turning off my video so that I will not obscure some of the PowerPoint presentation. These are my disclaimer and acknowledgements. Here's the outline of today's presentation. For the benefit of our international delegates, I'd like to expound on one of the terminologies. Advanced practice nurses or APNs are registered nurses who are master's prepared nurses and have undergone a one-year internship and successfully passed their summative assessment in the form of an OSCE in order to be able to provide clinical care at a higher level. A quick background leading to the study is that cardiovascular disease continues to be the number one killer internationally, and in Singapore, it is the third cause of death. This may continue to rise as Singapore's population of those above 65 doubles between 2015 and 2030. Additionally, an AMI episode of hospitalization is costly, compounded with the readmission rates as high as 20% seen in the United States. Notably, cardiac rehabilitation with a class 1 evidence for post-AMI secondary prevention to reduce readmissions, recurrent AMI, and death has been recommended. However, we know that the take-up rate is still in its teen and the challenge remains to reach out to the post-AMI patient population. APN-led services have also shown promising results in the heart failure patient population to reduce hospitalization, of which this has not been explored in the AMI patient population. Similarly, it is unknown if the use of telehealth can be beneficial for this group. For those who are interested, the Immaculate study has been published in JAMA last year, where it is a randomized controlled trial with 301 participants. Now, part of the Immaculate trial, it has many sub-studies, and the portion that my team of nurses were involved in had these following aims. That is to develop an APN-led telehealth service as a transitional nursing therapeutics, examine the feasibility and effectiveness of an APN-led telehealth rehabilitative program on readmissions and health-related outcome among patients with AMI post-discharge. Short, in short, ultra, understand participant experience and perspective and perception towards deploying telehealth as part of the healthcare provision post-discharge in Singapore. This is the framework that the study hinges on, which is in line with MOH3 Beyond to go beyond hospital to home. Hence, the APN-led telehealth aims to facilitate the healthy transition for an AMI patient with care monitoring, which includes vital sign monitoring and active titration of evidence-based medication and education. Here's a snapshot of the baseline characteristic of the trial participants. They were predominantly male in the 50s and enrolled from three acute hospitals. What I'd like to draw your attention to is the safety endpoints where there's no difference between the two groups of those enrolled in the remote management versus standard care. Though the dose intensity of beta blockers and ACE inhibitor ARBs were consistently higher in the telehealth group, it was not statistically significant. The next two slides are to illustrate the extensiveness of preparation, training, and alignment for the four APNs to embark on this study. The key is that there needs to be a comprehensive engagement with participants from vital signs to sign symptoms, education, and titration of medication. From the process evaluation via a qualitative approach with face-to-face -face interview, um, with a semi-structured guideline, six teams and 23 sub-teams emerged. Participants expressed that they benefited from a personalized care in enhancing their self-care behavior and sustaining lifestyle changes. Although it was remote monitoring, participants felt that they had a direct access to health care, especially when they needed to communicate when in distress. In summary, 
And on reflection of the proliferation of telehealth services due to the current COVID-19 pandemic, APN-led telehealth can be an effective method in the provision of care for post-AMI patients since there were no differences between the two groups in adverse events and the remote monitoring had better dose intensity. With this service, patients were able to have a smoother transition of care with lower readmission rates. This is a recent NUS alumni write-up, and I would like to stress that post-AMI patients have difficulties retaining all the instructions they receive from us during their hospitalization, especially after surviving a life-threatening event. Hence, it is critical that we as healthcare workers continue to explore alternatives to improve care. And that's um, a, a snapshot of what it looks like. We have advanced from telephonic call to video calls in recent days. One of the key takeaway points that I'd like to highlight is that with advancement in technology, while it has the potential to aid nurses at various platforms to deliver the highest quality of care, it should not deter or hinder them from regarding patients as vulnerable human beings who have needs that require healthcare providers to address as competently and humanely to the best of their training. We have reached to the end of the presentation and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Karen, for sharing your experience with us. Our last speaker is Dr. Mungun Chimek Dabba. She is the director of the National Cardiovascular Center at Shastin Central Hospital in Mongolia and has led the Mongolian National Telemedicine Project since 2004. She shares her experience with us in this talk, a 17-year history book, Impact of Telemedicine on CVD Case Management in Mongolia. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to participate and share our experience in this very important event. My name is Dr. Mungun Chimikdagwa. I'm a head of National Cardiovascular Center in Ulaanbaatar. Today, I would like to talk about our experience in Mongolia on using telemedicine for improving cardiovascular care nationwide. I have nothing to disclose. When we started the project 17 years ago, on top of all the limitations of developing country, there were many others. All specialized tertiary care hospitals were in capital city, resulting a big gap between central and provincial hospitals in regard of capacity, care quality. This gap actually were causing for people in remote places a difficulty in receiving good cardiovascular care locally in economical burden related to medical travel. 17 years ago, majority travels were via ground transportation, which required two, three days travel to most distant provinces. And the internet connection were very limited in the rural areas. In addition to that, harsh climate contributed to difficult travel, especially during winter time. On top of distance and capacity gap between hospitals, there were top priority problem of the health sector, cardiovascular disease, leading cause of mortality in our last more than 20 years. In addition, physicians who work in the rural hospitals were isolated in all means, limited possibilities on up-to-date knowledge, professional development, communication with peers. To deal with the issue required suitable to the context cost-efficient strategy which were chosen telemedicine tool for improving cardiovascular disease case management. Today, virtual health has been more and more recognizing as one of the suitable model of new healthcare, especially to help address rural health needs and narrow the rural-urban health divide. A complete telehealth strategy must incorporate multiple types of health and telehealth technology services acting as a complete and comprehensive solution that improve the delivery of healthcare for healthcare stakeholders, patients, and our communities. All these applications will be even more useful and adjusted in the future. Telemedicine has some four types. From these four types, we use store and forward telemedicine. I will highlight the experience we got through the usage of features, doctor-to-doctor -doctor communication, all sorts of useful medical data, medical imaging, test results, biosignals can be acquired and transmitted across 
vast distances. The biggest advantage of this type of telemedicine is that it doesn't require the simultaneous attention on the, of the delivering and the receiving parties. A field physician or specialist can collect the necessary data, upload it, and leave it for detailed inspection by another provider at a later time. In Mongolia, we have a using telemedicine within the project supported by government of Luxembourg since 2001. The project with the main goal to contribute better health for population has inside component using telemedicine for improving uh, cardiovascular case management. These are the first team members who actually worked in a huge distance within Mongolia as well as in Europe. Dedicated, secure, well-customized software development is important part of the project. Here is shown how chronologically developed telecommunication software we have been using all these years. Different features were added due to users' requests. In the beginning, it was only a simple program which allows us to exchange attached files. Then sooner or later, it became a form-like platform, functioning to seek advice from colleagues and opinions from other all others, including a reference center. Then it became with the feature of simple e-medical record. Later, it added features to save physicians time, uh, physicians time, easy operations like uh, physicians time easy, operations like recording intervention treatment, patient follow-up sections. These enable physicians to work in a close communication and monitoring and caring their patients from whatever distances between them. This is the main cardio program's homepage. The active tickets, which means question posted by other doctors, was seen first. Also, the physician's activity seen on the other pages. These are the sections of the system allowing to share and monitor, follow up more detailed, complete medical information of the patient. As being stored in for telemedicine system, it allows us the time to carefully consider and analyze all, uh, all of the that, uh, patient information collected, identifying trends over time as well as immediate changes. It allows us to apply evidence-based care practices to make more accurate diagnosis and treatment recommendations. Currently, more than 250,000 patients filed registered in the system, and physicians are using teleconsultation section uh, on their needs. Questions asked or posted patient files for second and third opinions from different rural hospitals are widely varying in terms of numbers. However, majority of teleconsultation requests were posted by doctors working in most remote provinces, except two provinces where either doctors were along with the heavy workload or lack of commitment and a lack of support from the hospital authorities. In general, telemedicine could diminish all these traditional steps for patients to get a tertiary level character consultation in our situation. If look what was triggering to ask questions, majority purpose was to get second and third opinion on diagnosis and treatment, but also substantial amount was for decision making, managing of the uh, managing of a reference for PCI, cardiac surgery, which are not available locally. In regard of the diagnosis, uh, of where they need to ask questions. Mainly it was ischemic heart disease, congenital heart disease, and the patient with arrhythmia triggered most of the questions. Patients follow up monitoring chronic disease from rural and central doctors are one of the important parts of our activity. Here, follow up activity shown by typology of disease. Red are uh, patients followed up after intervention or surgical treatment. Green shows patient followed before surgery or intervention by at least two doctors, one from province where a patient lives, another, from, another one from central level, specialized expert. From rural perspective, let's see what happened in uh, provinces. Dafon province, which is one of the most isolated, which is the most isolated province located in 1100 kilometers from capital city, province has province center has only two road entrance due to surrounding mountains on all sides. Civil air flights only one, two times per week. The province cardiologist joined to the uh, project since 2012. 
when two cardiologists uh, from this province joined to the project in, in 2012, the mortality in the province due to cardiovascular disease were one of the highest among all the provinces. Then during our eight years cooperation with the two of them, the number of patients referred to center was uh, steadily declining. If look inside of the referral, there are more and more patients avoided from unnecessary costly travel to central level when can have a proper treatment locally. And in contrast, those patients who need the cardiac surgery, interventional treatment, and other services which are not available locally have been identified early and referred to central level. These necessary referrals were raising. In regard of medical treatment, in accordance with the guidelines, the home province physicians could improve quality of cardiovascular disease medical treatment. Adherence to uh, treatment guidelines, for example, for ischemic heart disease and heart failure improved from 75 to 84 and 44 to 82 of adherence respectively. Also typology of medicines they use changes significantly as phys physicians were attending educational activities and provided the latest information with translation to in uh, native language. As a result, the mortality were steadily declining within years of our cooperation. In other provinces as well, I observed a positive trend of case management of cardiovascular disease. Here is a shown average necessary referrals from all provinces. As a result of our 17 years activity using telemedicine for improving patient care in cardiovascular disease field, committed cardiologists could together substantially contribute to decrease of cardiovascular disease mortality nationwide, despite more increasing prevalence of disease due to increasing risk factors related to many factors. That way, this achievement is in line with the goal settled in the Mongolia Sustainable Development Goal 2030 in regard of reducing cardiovascular disease mortality. As a conclusion, there are many positive elements. In country with similar context as Mongolia, storing forward type of telemedicine is useful, cost-efficient tool for improving case management of chronic disease and secondary prevention. Telemedicine shares the biggest workload of health services, making service accessible and affordable. For patients, it can be time-saving, comfortable, cost-efficient, as it is. It cuts an unnecessary travel and steps to reach expert consultation, especially for rural patients. For physicians, using telemedicine allows to uh, apply evidence-based care practices to make more accurate diagnosis and treatment recommendations. Working in the connected professional network is contributing to professional team building, reaching isolation and improving self-confidence for rural doctors. But there are challenges. Even though telemedicine is becoming a more futuristic tool for health services like visits, follow-up, chronic disease, not every service benefits from telehealth. Physicians to physician support depends on the personal commitment of physicians and their workload as well. Equity of reimbursement for virtual visit consultations for consultation between physicians for second and third opinions and the relevant regulations are essential for further beneficial utilization. Security of private health data is another concern for many patients. Strong support on teleconsultation, telehealth from healthcare providers and internet service providers further needs to be increased. Percentage of patients who can use telemedicine program are still limited, particularly among low income and remote patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mungujumek. Thank you for sharing your experience spending a decade with us. Let us now welcome back our session chair, Professor Escobar, and our speakers, Professor Vaka Navaha. Dr. Karen, Dr. Mongo, for the panel discussion. Without further ado, Professor Escobar, please kick off panel discussion. We have about five minutes. Well, I, I understand there are questions from Dr. Baka. 
Uh, do you have the questions for Dr. Baca? Oh, yes. Okay. So uh, a few of the earlier questions on telemedicine in rural areas have been covered by our later speakers. Um, but many of our guests have inquired also on how was telemedicine financed in the various countries. So uh, the question for Professor Baka Navaha was on cost. How was the home tele monitoring devices um, financed? Hello, Agnes. Uh, hello uh, to all the audience. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this event. It, it is a great pleasure to be here. So um, I will try to answer the questions. Um, I, I think I have like three questions here. The first one is um, about how it was financed. Well, in this case, my institution um, take the decision to finance the, the project, the program. So we buy the, the devices and it's a free program from the population. Okay, hi. I think uh, that there might be some network issues, right? Um, let's let's move on to the next question while we wait for Dr. Bakanan Baha to get back. Um, maybe um, we can hear about uh, how how was telemedicine financed in the other countries? Dr. Mango, will you be able to share about that with us? Well, in our uh, hello, good evening, everybody. I'm ha very happy to be here. Uh, in our experience, we have a support from the um, government of Luxembourg <clears throat> for uh, initiating this project and been uh, using um, uh, the fund for uh, development of the software in the telecommunication network, etc. But uh, as of today, uh, uh, according to today's uh, situation, it is uh, it's, it is not uh, that much uh, unaffordable uh, expenses to use uh, telemedicine for, for much uh, bigger uh, the beneficial uh, issues. So um, in every country, even in developing countries, uh, as of today, it, it is really affordable um, issue. Uh, to develop uh, software a uh, suitable, applicable, feasible, and uh, mm, appropriate for local context. And uh, it can easily be used by, um, by, the, by uh, members, of, uh, members in the network. The only uh, biggest issue, in my opinion, it would be uh, the commitment of uh, members to use it uh, as much as uh, um, as much as uh, providing uh, the good care and uh, as much as demonstrating its uh, worth uh, to the patient care. Thank you, Dr. Mongo. All right, I think um, we are in our last minute of the session. Professor Escobar, um, perhaps you can uh, leave us with some last words on our session today. Yes, uh, I, I think the lectures have clearly shown that telemedicine is an important tool for medical care. Uh, not only in the diagnosis, but also in the chronic uh, patient's care as well. And I think uh, there are many challenges ahead, but I am absolutely sure that it will be solved. And uh, telemedicine uh, became already a very important tool for uh, medical care all over the world. And I hope that the, all the governments include uh, telemedicine in their, as a public health policy. And I think it's uh, very clear that it's a cost-effective way to practice medicine in, on the, for the benefit of all of our patients. That is uh, what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Escobar. That was a very interesting discussion about telehealth. 
unfortunately, due to the interest of time, we have to close our session now. Right? So telehealth will definitely play a huge role in our future healthcare landscape. We thank you for spending the evening with all of us. Please join us in our next session on CV pharmacotherapy in women. Thank you, everyone.